Okay, so I'm assuming we are live. I am assuming that's happened. <laughs> I ended up doing Hopefully. this weird little chatty bit at the beginning where I'm like, are we live? Are we not live? I'm guessing we're live. Let's just pretend we're live. Okay, so um, assuming we are, welcome everyone to this We Move session. Um, to the folks who are here in the room and folks who are online as well. Um, we're delighted that you are here. Um, if you haven't come across the We Move sessions before, um, it's a selection, a series, as it were, of 25 free seminars that are being streamed live from London, and you can attend either IRL or URL. So um, we move 25 seminars delivered by music and technology experts who happen to be women and gender minority. Um, we've had an incredible run of topics and um, experiences so far. So this evening, we are delighted to welcome Sarah Adkins to this We Move session. And uh, we will be taking questions at the end. So is, I know Sarah's going to be absolutely fascinating this evening, but just try and hold it in, OK? You folks in the room and you folks on the stream until the end. And then we will collect all your questions together, and we will, um, and we will discuss them. Um, so if you haven't come across Sarah before, um, Sarah is a music technologist and a software engineer and a guitarist. So rotates through those talents um, and particularly focuses on promoting the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Intelligence, ugh, there are L's in that word, in the creative arts. Um, that you've done loads of cool stuff that I'm going to let you talk about in a minute, but just okay. to say that you're currently um, studying for your Master in Science in Sound and Music and Computing? No, Sound and Music Computing. Sound and Music Computing. There we yeah. go. At Queen Mary University at London, and uh, before that you worked for Bose in Boston, um, and that your senior project, which is Creating with the Machine, which I'm sure you'll mention, um, has done loads of cool things and basically has was premiered by the Carnegie Mellon Exploded Ensemble in 2018, which sounds cool, and was awarded the Henry Almero Almero. Memorial, thank you, Henry Almero <laughs> Memorial Fund for Inclusive Creativity, um, and was also presented at the Hackaday Super Conference in LA in 2019. Very cool. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to let you be cool now, and okay. I'm going to go over there. So um, please welcome Sarah Atkins. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, both in person and online. Uh, and thank you, Music Hackspace, uh, for having me. Uh, my name's Sarah, and today I'm going to be talking about a couple different techniques, uh, machine learning techniques, that you can incorporate into your music composition process. Um, so I'm not going to be assuming you have any background in coding or machine learning. We're kind of going to start from the basics. Um, look at the intuition behind some of these machine learning models and then do some tech demos that will, you know, hopefully work. Um, yeah. So a little bit about me, first of all. Uh, I'm Sarah. Uh, I'm a guitarist. I like to make sounds with my guitar, but also with my laptop. So I got into music production a couple years ago and also recently uh, live coding algorithms kind of, th kind of thing. Uh, my bachelor's is in computer science and music from Carnegie Mellon in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and as already mentioned, uh, for my capstone project for that degree, um, I worked on some compositions that combine um, traditional and um, AI methods of composition to create some interactive performances. Um, and then after my bachelor's, I moved to Boston and I was working at the headphone company Bose as a machine learning, learning engineer for a couple years. Um, so I was working on generative music for sleep and some embedded deep learning algorithms for speech enhancement that would eventually go into hearing aids. Um, and then now I'm a master's student at Queen Mary University of London. And for my thesis project, I'm working on integrating machine learning models into the live coding language Super Collider. Um, so enough about me, let's get on to what we're going to cover in the talk today. Um, so basically, I'm going to convince you why you should try out machine learning in your songwriting and show you how you can do it. Uh, so we'll talk about a couple of the use cases uh, for machine learning uh, in composition. And then we'll talk about why um, creative AI is hard as opposed to applying AI to other types of problems. Um, we'll then get into two different types of networks I'm going to cover today. The first is recurrent neural networks, and we're going to go through a couple demos that show 
how you can use those for melody generation. Um, and then we're going to talk about autoencoders and I'll give some demos about how you can use those for timbre or tone transfer. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about a couple of next steps that you can take if you're interested in this sort of thing um, and want to get more involved in this work. All right, so machine learning, you've probably heard about it all over you know, the internet and everywhere, um, but why would you ever want to use it in music? Um, so ML can be really useful for creating melodies and extending melodies you've already written. So a couple use cases include like helping out with writer's block by generating some melody options that you might want to use. Um, exploring different ways you could combine a musical phrase or connect different musical phrases together, uh, and also creating automatic harmonization of melody lines. Uh, another cool use case is for software instruments and timbre transfer. Um, so there are some machine learning models available that are alternatives to um, synthesize software instruments and sampled software instruments. Because um, a lot of times software instruments can be pretty time consuming to make. You have to have a lot of very specific recordings of an instrument under very many different conditions. Um, and machine learning can kind of automate a lot of that away. You could model um, any instrument you want with like less than an hour of audio. So for instance, you could create a model that represents like your specific singing voice. Um, also something that's really fun to play around with is starting from a machine learning model that was built to emulate a traditional instrument, say a violin, and then playing around with some of the parameters and adjusting it to create like a new weird sound. Um, so really interesting things happen when these models break and do things you're not expecting. Uh, and then finally, I'm not going to get into this topic in the talk today, but I also want to mention that there's a lot of cool work um, being done with like AI performance partners. And this is a lot of what I did um, for my capstone project and my bachelor's is focusing on a model that would respond to you while you're playing music in real time and kind of acting as an improvisation partner. Um, but for all of these, um, basically the, the bottom line is that the goal here is to enhance um, human compositions and we're not trying to replace um, any composers or songwriters with machine learning. Um, these models can produce really cool output that can inspire you to be more creative or kind of make things easier for you, but they're not meant to ever be like a replacement for an actual human musician. Okay, and then let's talk a little bit about what machine learning is and why it is a hard problem when you apply it to a creative art like music. Um, so a typical machine learning model relies on what we call an objective function or a loss function, which is a quantifiable metric of how good a result it outputs is. Um, so a lot of tasks that machine learning is applied to have pretty obvious objectives. So um, if you show a model um, a picture of a dog and you ask it what, uh, what items are in this photo, it's pretty easy to tell when it's given you a correct answer because it'll say, yes, there's a dog in that photo or no, there isn't. Um, models are also used for like translating between languages. So for instance, like you could translate a sentence from English to German um, and there's a correct answer that exists for that. Um, so it's easy to come up with an objective function for it. Uh, and then um, I'm going to start with a visual example to kind of showcase um, how a machine learning model is trained for like a typical use case. Um, so this is an example from the MNIST data set, which is um, a giant data set of handwritten digits. And the goal here is to um, train a machine learning model that is able to look at a picture of a handwritten digit and output what number it is. Um, so this data set is made up of like millions of examples and you'll pass your training data input through it. Um, and the ML model, which is basically just a mathematical function with millions of tunable parameters, will pass that input through and output an answer. So in this case, before it's trained, it might output very confidently, this is a five uh, and it will be wrong because it's clearly not a five. Um, but luckily with our training data set, we assume that each image is also associated with a label. So we know what the correct answer is here. Um, the training data label is, no, this is not a five, this is a four. So 
we take the answer that the machine learning model gave and we compare it to the correct answer and we send that through our objective function. And we ask it, did that output match the label? And it will, it will answer yes or no. And then we can update the parameters of this black box machine learning model based on whether we were right or wrong. Um, and this, re this process is repeated um, millions of times uh, during training. And once the model is trained, we hope that it has correctly learned how to classify the handwritten digits. So instead of saying, oh, this is a five, it will know that this is a four because it has seen so many examples of a four that it's able to learn what makes up a four. Uh, and that is all fine and great, but how do we apply this to music creation? Because as I'm sure you know, there's not really a clear metric for what makes art or music good. Um, it's subjective and people have different tastes. So it's hard to really judge if a particular output um, is correct or not. It's hard to quantify like what would be an objective function for whether music is good. Um, but there are a couple workarounds that we're going to cover. Um, but the general idea is that we judge the generated output based on how closely it matches the training data. So say that you're um, creating a model that you want to generate box style corrals. Um, you would judge your output based on how similar it is to a box corral. And now we're going to get into our first type of model um, that's used for melody generation. Uh, so this is called a recurrent neural network. Um, and the, basically the idea here is that we're going to treat music as a list of events. If you're familiar with the MIDI protocol, you might be familiar with this idea already. Um, you can just think of the score as a sequence of notes. Um, and when we're generating the music, we're going to try and figure out what the likelihood of the next note is based on previous notes. Um, and this concept of basing our output on the previous notes is what makes the network recurrent. Um, recurrence in this case means like memory of the past. So the reason this type of network is powerful is because it's not just taking in um, a static input. Each time it generates the next note, it has more input data passed through it. Um, so let's take a look at what that might look like when a recurrent neural network is fully trained. Um, so you can see here that we're starting um, with the first seven notes of a C major scale. So that's the notes that we have so far. And then we're asking the network, all right, I've played these seven notes so far. Uh, what note should I play next? Um, and what the network is going to output is called a probability distribution, which is just a list of the likelihoods for each possible output. Um, so I've only showed three here, but in actuality, this would be like a really big list of all possible notes, maybe in the range of the piano. Um, and each one would be assigned a probability of how likely it is that that note comes next in the sequence. Um, and in our case, since we're assuming that this model is already trained, we know that, hey, we have the first seven notes of a C major scale, it's pretty likely that our next note is going to be a C, so we complete the scale. So you can see that the C note here has a 78% of, of being next. That's what we expect. But that's not always the case. Um, it's not always the case that like these seven notes are going to follow by a C. Um, we might also play a D, for instance, because that's still in the correct key. It's just a little bit less likely. And then finally, a note that's not in the key of C major, like this A sharp, is going to have a very low probability of being picked. Um, so once the network has generated this probability distribution, um, we're basically just going to sample from it. Um, so pick one of these notes weighed by its likelihood. Um, in this case, we're probably going to pick the C because that was the most likely. Um, and then that gets fed back through the neural network. And we do this all again, and we'll generate the next note. Um, so if you're familiar with DSP, you might recognize that this is pretty similar to an IIR filter because we have the idea of the output passing back through to the input. Um, and something else that I want to stress here is that um, these models don't actually know anything about chords or scales. Like they don't have a concept of, oh, this is a C major scale or this was an A chord. Um, they're just learning patterns in the training data. Um, they don't actually have any music theory knowledge. All right, so that example that I just showed was um, 
starting from the premise of we already have a fully trained um, recurrent neural network. Um, so next, let's talk about how we would actually train one of these. Um, how do we learn the correct probability distributions that we want to output? Um, so for a model, we're going to need two things. We'll need a training data set and an objective function. Um, so for training data sets, there's a ton of um, data available online. There's um, a pretty popular MIDI data set of Bach chorales um, and folk music as well. Um, and for, object for our objective function, we're going to use something called cross entropy loss, which I'm not going to explain in too much detail, but I'll give a bit of an intuition about it in a moment. Um, all right, so let's say that we're starting with our RNN that has not been trained at all whatsoever. So we give it the first four notes of twinkle, twinkle, little star. Um, and we know what the next note should be. So this is our process during training. So we send that through the RNN and we ask, like, what do you think the next note should be? Um, but the RNN is basically just initialized with random values. So it really doesn't know what to do. So it's probably just going to output um, a list of like, hey, I don't really know, just play each of these other notes with an equal probability. Um, but since, we're, since we have the training example, twinkle, twinkle, little star, to work with, we know that the correct note that comes next in this is an A. So we know what the probability distribution should look like is 100% chance we play an A and 0% of everything else. So what this cross entropy loss function is going to do is compare um, how similar these two distributions are. Um, in this case, they're not very similar. Um, one of them is having an equal probability for all notes, and this one is saying 100% we're playing this specific note. Um, so based on um, how high or low that loss value is, we're going to update the weights of our RNN. And then we're going to repeat this loop for each transition in every single training example. So you, you can see why this um, models like this end up taking a while to train, because let's say you have a thousand songs, you have to run this loop um, for every single note that happens in each song. And oftentimes when we're training, we'll run through the entire training data set multiple times. Um, but you can see here um, the RNN has updated that our next note um, is an A. And again, we're asking it, hey, like, what should we play next? And let's say at this point it's a little bit more trained. So it knows, like, oh, actually, I think I'm pretty sure that an A should be played next, but I'm not super sure. And in our training example, we know that the next note is 100% an A. So we compare these distributions, and the loss should be a little bit better than before because these distributions of percentages are more similar. Uh, and then we do it one more time. Uh, we now have six notes in our input, and we're saying, all right, what should the seventh note be? And in this case, the RNN has started to get a little bit better. It's pretty sure that we should be playing a G. Um, so again, we'll compare that to the actual training example, which is 100%. We should be playing a G. Um, and the loss is going to get even better this time, so we update the weights. Um, so these networks start out outputting like very random values, and then as they train, their weights start to converge, um, and they start to model the distribution of what the musical note should be. Um, all right, and I think that's enough theory for the moment. So the next thing I wanted to get into um, is a demo. So this is a project called Folk RNN that I'm going to talk about. And it's trained on a corpus of folk music from the session.org. So if you're familiar with like Celtic or Irish folk music, you might have used this website before. It's just like a giant database of folk music. Um, and it has a couple controls um, for the music generation. So it allows the user to pick the key signature and the time signature. Uh, but the most important control here is something called temperature. Um, so I'll explain a little bit what temperature is. Um, so we've talked about these probability distributions. Let's say that this is a distribution that the model has output. Um, so most of the time, it should be playing a C, sometimes a D, very rarely, an A sharp. Um, and this temperature parameter is basically going to determine um, how, um, how variable the output is. So if we set this um, to a really low value, it's pretty much always going to choose the most likely option. But if we um, set the value a little bit higher, it might be more likely to pick this A sharp. 
Um, so this is a parameter that you want to tune such that like you're getting interesting outputs, but you're not just basically regurgitating something from the training data. And we'll get into a couple of examples of that now. Um, so the nice thing about Folk RNN is it's available in a browser. You can just go to folkrnn.org and play, play around with it. Gives you a little bit of information about the project. Um, and then over here on the left, um, we have the ability to actually generate a tune with it. Um, so it gives you a couple different models to play around with. We're, gonna, we're just going to use the one from the, the session.org. But basically, each of these was trained on a different set of music. Um, let's stick with 4.4 and C major. And 1 is a good temperature parameter for now. Um, and then we also can enter like a starter note for the generation. So let's just start with a C. Um, and you can see that this is what the actual generated output looks like. Um, it's just a bunch of text describing the notes. Um, and what's really nice is that it gives you the output um, as MIDI in your browser. So you can just hear what it came up with. So a couple of nice things about this that it generated here is you can see that it started out with this theme of a dotted quarter note followed by an eighth note. And it actually repeated that a couple times um, throughout the song. So it has a little bit of an idea of like building up a motif that will repeat um, several measures later. Uh, and it also pretty well follows the A, B folk song structure of this. these two measure, These two lines are like our A section, and then this is these two lines are our B section. Um, and then let's play around with the temperature slider a little bit. So I'm going to show what happens if you set it to something really low. I will not make you sit through any more of it. Um, so you can see what happens is when we set this value too low, the model is just always picking whatever the most likely next note is. Um, so it's basically just like the average of every single thing that it's been trained on. So we, we see that like, all right, we've got a perfect fifth, and then we play the tonic a lot, and then we do a couple small jumps, and they're all quarter notes. So this is not very interesting. So that's definitely too low of a temperature parameter there. Um, and let's try setting it to something higher, like 3. Um, you can already tell. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's hear that. Um, so if you like 12 tone music, um, you might think that that is a fantastic output. And, and I would encourage you to use it in your work. Um, but it's definitely not folk music, because what's happening here um, is when you set the temperature really high, you're basically kind of overwriting all of the weights that the neural network has learned. You're just telling it, like, play something weird all the time. Um, so this is why it tends to be best practice to, like, you have to fidget around with the number a little bit, but set it to something that's not too high, not too low. Like, here's another one that seems reasonable. You could see it, it added in that, that B flat there, which was a little bit weird. But other than that, like that sounds pretty folky. Um, and another cool thing that you can do here um, is actually highlight things. So if you wanted to generate something else that started the same way, you could just copy it and regenerate. Um, and now we have like a slightly different. Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, that's folk RNN. And then um, what you can do from here, you obviously aren't going to be doing your full music making routine in your browser. So what you can do is just download the MIDI file, um, and you can open it up in your DAW. So let's try um, opening that up in Logic. So now we... Yeah, so this is um, once you've generated something in folk RNN, you would obviously want to bring it into your doll and play around with it there. All right, and then um, there was another um, application that I wanted to showcase here. Um, this is from Google, their Magenta team um, put out a set of plugins that are available as desktop applications or Ableton Live plugins. Um, and it's a similar model, but it allows you to generate, um, say, like a specific number of continuations from an input MIDI file. So say you have the start of a melody that you like, but you're not sure how to continue it. Um, you could put in um, what you have so far as an input, tell it how many variations to generate, um, and how many bars you would like to generate for. Um, the big difference between this and folk RNN is it wasn't trained on a specific genre, so you tend to get a lot more generic music. Um, and I was hoping to demo this specifically, but before this, um, I tested it and it kept crashing. So let's try one more time. Um, Oh my god. <laughs> oh, it's a miracle. OK, great. <laughs> All right, so we're going to uh, continue a melody. Um, so I'm just going to choose, um, I have this MIDI file that's like a bar of a glass animal song. Uh, and let's say we want three bars. We're going to keep the temperature slider at one. And let's generate uh, four variations. And it put them somewhere. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. I put them in the inputs directory, but that's fine. All right, so then if we want to hear what these sound like, um, we can go into Logic and import them. I realize this is a bit of a, a clunky um, interface for these for these MIDI applications. Um, it's also available as an Ableton Live plugin. I just don't have Ableton. Um, all right, so let's listen to the first continuation that it came up with. Uh, so the first measure is um, the actual notes from the song, and then the final three are stuff that it generated. And then let's loop it as well. <laughs> So that one's OK. It kind of like loses the sense of the key a little bit, but not bad. Um, let's try another one of the options. Cool. So I kind of like how that one like repeated the first measure again in the third measure. Um, okay, and I think uh, that's enough of of MIDI stuff for now. Um, let's go back to slide deck. All right. So um, just like talking a little bit about evaluating how some. Of, of these applications work. So first of all, it's really great to see researchers are releasing their work in a way that's accessible to a non-technical -techn audience. Uh, it's really nice that you can try out some of these models without having a background um, in coding or machine learning. 
Uh, and as you saw, the RNNs are pretty good at modeling short-term dependencies uh, in the music, so it's able to like pick up on something that happened in measure one and maybe repeat it four measures later. Um, but when you try to make longer songs with these models, it kind of breaks down. Um, it can't really maintain themes or sections over a full song. Um, so these are, are really more useful for like building up a melodic idea, not necessarily generating a whole song uh, with these networks. Um, there's also only a couple parameters that you can tweak, um, the temperature slider being the main one, also time signature and key. So it, you don't really feel super in control of the output, and often the models can start to drift away from their original key signature. Um, and there's also not really a way to interact with the model once the music has been generated. So you can import it into your DAW like I did, and you could tweak some of the notes manually, but that's a bit clunky. Um, you can't provide feedback to the model on what specifically you liked and didn't like, um, and you, you can only just tell it, like, regenerate. Um, you can't highlight a section of the output and be like, hey, like, I liked most of this, but not this section, please regenerate it. So. They're useful for kind of exploring melodic ideas, but there definitely are a lot of limitations in terms of like interacting with them as a compositional partner. Um, and then the next type of model I want to talk about um, is for timbre transfer or tone transfer. So the idea of this um, is making one instrument sound like another. So like a human voice sounding like a violin or um, a synthesizer sounding like a flute. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about applications for that. Um, but starting off with a visual example, so tone transfer is pretty similar to style transfer in the visual domain. So the idea is we have an input that we want to capture the high level structure of. So like say we have the Mona Lisa, we want to create a new version of the Mona Lisa that um, saves the structure of the image. So we still want the woman to be in it, but we want to modernize it a little bit. So let's say we want to take the artistic style from this second image. Um, so from here, we want to capture the low-level features, such as the color palette and the brush stroke. Um, so what a style transfer model will do is it will combine um, the high-level features from one piece of, of input with the lower-level features of another and produce something like this as a result. So we have Mona Lisa in this more abstract style. And we can apply this to music in a very similar way um, so I'm going to turn down the volume here. Um, let's say we have an audio recording we want to keep the high level features of. So um, let's say we have this audio of this male singing. Somewhere So we want to keep the pitch of this original recording and also like the dynamic expression of his performance, but we want to make it sound like it's coming out of a different instrument. So we'll combine the high level features from this recording with the low level features um, of a violin. So we ha will have one model that's trained on the ta to emulate the timbre of a violin. So we're taking pitch and volume from this uh, model and the harmonic distribution from the timbre model. And what we should end up with um, is an audio recording that sounds like if a violin were to reproduce that same performance. So it sounds a little funky. Um, these models, these types of models definitely aren't perfect, but where they mess up is actually when they produce really interesting results. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how these models work. Oh, actually, no. First, we're going to talk about why you want to do this. Um, all right, so um, these timbre transfer models can be a new approach to software instruments, um, like I mentioned before. So usually, you know, your options for software instruments are you have a recorded one that's based off of someone playing the same instrument, specific notes in a wide variety of recording conditions. So those are, are pretty time consuming to make and require a lot of hard coding. Um, but with timbre transfer models, what you can do is you can model um, an obscure instrument or something specific like your voice with just 30 minutes of audio. And it doesn't have to be you playing specific notes. It could just be like you singing 10 of your favorite songs. Um, and that is usually enough to build up a model of your voice. Um, 
And then like the other type of software instruments, um, synthesized instruments like FM synthesis, they often sound less realistic and there are a lot of parameters to tune. Um, and I would say that these timbre transfer models, some of them sound better than FM, um, but I would say like the main benefit is you can model an instrument that like you don't already have um, a sampled version of. Um, but my favorite thing to do with these types of models is play around with creating new and unique timbres that don't necessarily match um, a traditional instrument. So you could start from a model that's meant to emulate a violin, for instance, and you could adjust the parameters to create like a new and obscure sound. Uh, and we'll see some examples of that later. Um, and also sending unexpected inputs into these models produce some pretty cool results. Um, so for instance, um, sending like a drum loop through a saxophone model or like screaming into a violin model or powering a trumpet with a sawtooth wave um, all produce some really cool stuff. Um, and here's an example of sending um, a drum uh, recording through a saxophone model that I think is pretty cool. <laughs> So it doesn't sound like exactly like a sa like a saxophone, but like priming this model with something it wasn't trained on um, just kind of makes a cool sound that if you're into avant-garde music, um, you might like. Um, great, so what kind of model do we use for uh, timbre transfer? So um, this is usually done using a model called a variational autoencoder. And what these models attempt to do is to take the input data and reduce it to a small set of its most important features so a second model can then reconstruct it. Um, so again, an example from the visual domain, we have this picture of a cat. We send it through um, encoder, an encoder model that's maybe trained on cat images and it spits out the important features of this cat. Like maybe we care about its hair length or how angry it is because <laughs> this cat is, is clearly very angry. Um, eye size and then maybe the color of its fur. And then the decoder model um, takes those um, features and tries to reconstruct the original image. And in the visual domain, um, we can calculate how well this model is doing by just comparing it pixel by pixel. Um, and for audio, it's pretty similar. We usually do it um, with comparing the spectrograms. Um, and obviously, we would have uh, different features than a cat. Um, so for this, we just need a training data set of audio recordings for our target instrument, say like a violin. Uh, and usually, you can do this with less than 30 minutes of audio. Um, and we also need a loss function again. So in this case, we're just comparing the spectrogram of the input and the output audio. Um, so what these encoder models are doing is they're trying to compress like this very like high bandwidth input into just a small set of like the features that really are most important. So um, if you consider just like four seconds of audio at 44.1K, that's two, almost 200,000 samples, which is a very large amount of data. So what the, this encoder model is going to do is it's going to try to take that big amount of data and represent it as a really small amount of data um, and figure out what features are most important to do that. Um, so it's really kind of just like learning a form of compression. And then we hope that as we're training this autoencoder, it's going to learn what high-level features are most important for it to encode. Um, so for a timbre transfer model, we might want to capture um, the attack of the instrument, the ratio between the harmonics, um, or if we're trying to, instead of, of mapping tone, we're trying to represent like a full song, then maybe we care more about things like the pitches or the instrumentation or the rhythmic complexity. All of these could end up being features in the latent feature vector. Uh, but, there, but there's kind of a catch here, unfortunately, is we don't actually know um, what features the model is going to decide are important enough to include in this latent feature vector. Um, so maybe some of these features are going to be interpretable as musical parameters, but probably they won't be. So that's why I've replaced them all with question marks right here. 
Um, the model is basically just choosing features that minimize the loss value at the end of the day, so we really don't have any guarantee it's going to converge to useful features. Um, but regardless, what the decoder model is going to do is it's going to take just these feature values that the encoder outputs and attempt to reconstruct the original audio. And it doesn't know anything about the original input signal. It's only relying on those, that vector of feature values to reconstruct the output. Um, but one of the nice things about autoencoder models compared to like RNNs um, is once we have a particular output, we can adjust it, unlike RNNs where you would basically have to click the regeneration button. Um, once we have a feature vector for a specific instrument, we could actually adjust any one of these values and we could generate a new output that is similar to our input, uh, but slightly different. So this is a really cool thing to play around with in a sound design sense that we'll have a demo of later. All right, and then the first example of timbre transfer that I'm going to go over is DDSP. So this is, uh, again, some work done by the Google Magenta team. Um, basically, we have an encoder model that, say, is trained on violin audio. Uh, we also have a decoder that's trained on violin. Um, and we could send um, the output of our, our male singer into it. And the decoded audio will sound like a violin performing the same performance. Uh, something to note here is that this model specifically extracts the pitch and loudness of the input directly. Um, and this is done because we want the encoder model to learn things that are specific to violin timbre and not worry about score level features like the notes that are being played or how loud they are. So this allows the encoder model to just represent um, features that are specific to the tone of the violin. Um, and once a model's trained on a specific instrument, you can pass any audio through. So a fun thing to do is to pass the sound of a cat. This is our cat from a couple slides ago coming back. Uh, we can pass this audio through our violin model, and then we can uh, reconstruct that cat meowing to sound like a violin. All right, and then uh, let's go on to a couple of demos. Um, it's really great that a lot of these models are available as VST plugins, so we're going to go back into Logic and um, let's start with this one. Um, so I have my, my synth hooked up here. Yeah, it still works. All right. Um, so I just have this set to do like a basic sawtooth wave, um, and I'm going to launch this uh, DDSP plugin. Um, and then let's turn it on. Ooh. All right, so this has a couple different pre-trained models that you can choose from, but let's start with the flute model. Um, and you can see here that, well, actually, I'll just play and then I'll explain it, so. Oh, no. That really does not sound good, does it? Uh, let's see if we can play something else from it. All right, let's try restarting. Um, all right, so all right, so that part's working, and then let's see if we can turn this on. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so uh, so you, what you can see happening in the plugin here. Um, is this kind of purple outline is representing um, the pitch and volume range of the data that this flute model was trained on. And then when I play, 
you can see the pitch and volume that it's picking up. Um, so for the most realistic sound, um, you want to try and um, get the little circle to be inside um, the range that the model was trained on. Um, so for instance, if we go to a different model that was maybe, this one's trained on a bassoon, and we try to play these high notes, um, you can see that it's, it's coming outside of, of its box, and that definitely doesn't sound like a bassoon because it wasn't trained on audio that was this high. Um, but luckily we have our little pitch shift dial so we can kind of bring it back in range. Cool. Let's go back to the flute model. Um, so we have a couple controls that we can play around with here. Um, so if we kind of slide this to the to the left, this is kind of adjusting. It almost is like a low pass filter on the sound, and it's adjusting like how breathy it is. Um, so you can play around with that, and then moving this little box up and down um, affects like how intensely you're playing the instrument. Yeah, so you need to kind of play around with these parameters until you get something you're happy with. Um, something else to mention is that um, the pitch detector on this is monophonic, so if you try to play two notes at once, you kind of get some weird results. So, yeah, it's like I don't, uh, it's trying to pick out one pitch, but it can't, so. Yeah, and you can get. Uh, some pretty weird notes during transitions too. Um, but that's pretty fun to play around with. And I'm just, again, just passing a sawtooth wave through it, which is one of the most um, basic things you can do with this, but it tends to produce um, some pretty good results. So. so that's the trumpet model, which sounds pretty good, but let's bring down the pitch a little bit. Um, and then let's let's get into something a little bit more interesting. So um, another fun thing to do that I mentioned is to prime one of these models um, with inputs that it wasn't expecting. So um, I have this drum loop recorded here. Oh no! Oh my gosh! <laughs> that was great. All right. Um, yeah. So we're just going to play the drum loop by itself. So I find stuff like that really fun to play around with, just, just sending unexpected inputs um, through these models. Um, and I also have this one um, that I really like. Uh, I mentioned, I've mentioned cats a couple times, so let's, <laughs> let, let's send some cat sounds through. Um, so here's our unprocessed audio. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, <laughs> just the cat. Okay, and this one sounds pretty good through the flute sound. And then let's add the drums back in. All right, so there you go. You can even incorporate uh, cats and turn them into flutes, so that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> All right, and then another plugin, this isn't um, DDSP, but this is one that recently um, was released for beta testing um, by ByteDance. Um, it's pretty similar, it's called Mouth. Um, it has this really cool um, 
Thai flute sounds that I recorded and ended up liking. And one thing I like about this plugin is it allows you to um, play around with the mix between uh, the input audio and the transferred audio. Um, so you can see here uh, on this track, I just adjusted it from like 100%. You're only hearing the transferred audio to 88. You're hearing a little bit of the original. Um, so let me just play this one solo so we don't hear all this other crap. Oh, turn the loop off. And then I played around with some short notes, which sound pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's just another uh, plugin option. I believe the beta testing for this one is still open if you want to try it out. One cool thing about this one um, is they also have a MIDI mode. So instead of controlling it um, with audio, you can control it um, with MIDI and set up the like attack and decay parameters yourself. Um, I'm not set up to do that right now, but just another option. Uh, okay. Then let's go back to the presentation. All right, so um, another uh, timbre transfer example I wanted to go over is the RAVE model, um, which stands for, I think, like real-time audio variational encoder. Um, so this recently came out of AirCam, um, and they released it um, as part of a Max MSP external that allows you to um, load in arbitrary uh, machine learning models into the visual programming language Max, and it works with pure data. Um, as well. Um, so this one is a similar network to DDSP, um, but it doesn't track the pitch and loudness directly like DDSP does. Uh, and one nice benefit it has over DDSP is the whole latent space um, is adjustable. So you can see an example of it here. Um, this is our encoder function, and we're just connecting um, each latent variable here. There are eight of them to the decoder. Um, and the model that they've publicly released um, is trained on human speech, which produces some pretty cool outputs. Um, it's available as a VST plugin as well, but I'm gonna demo the Max version because my computer keeps crashing when I run the VST. Uh, it seems to still be a little bit buggy. Um, so let's close Logic for now and open up Max. Let's make sure our audio is set up correctly. Uh, yep. All right, so this is a similar type of um, autoencoder model like we've covered before. Um, you can see that we call it with this encode function, um, and then we can connect each of the feature vectors directly to the decode. So I have a couple audio examples here, um, and we can control the wet-dry mix of it with this slider. Um, so let's start off with, off with this uh, rainbow voice uh, audio we've heard before. Um, so just to explain, again, um, 
This model that I'm using is trained on human speech. It's not trained on singing specifically. Um, so you're always going to get this kind of garbled output sound. But I think it sounds pretty cool. So let's try a couple others. All right. Um, yeah, no, that is creepy. Uh, and then the nice thing that you can do here is these are our feature vectors. Um, we're taking them directly from the encoder and just passing them through. But if you wanted to make them a little bit more adjustable, um, you could instead set them manually. Uh, and then now it's connected to this slider. Well, well some. <laughs> oh, no, there we go. see what I mean in that we don't actually know what each of these feature variables is doing. Like I'm sliding this up and down. But if I asked you like what musical feature is that, um, it's, it's a little bit obscure and hard to say. Uh, and then let's try controlling another one of them. Endless hours of entertainment um, here. This one originally sounds like. That's the original. <laughs> So that's one way you can play around with Rave. But the other way is you can actually bypass the encoder um, entirely and just um, kind of send um, a random feature vector through. Um, so this starts to just sound like someone is speaking English, but maybe you don't understand the English language. But you can play around with it the same way. Okay, I think that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's Rave. Um, this one again is trained on a, a speech model. This is just one that Aircam uh, provided in one of their demos. Uh, but you can also train up a model that is maybe based on you playing guitar or you singing or something like that, and get some some cool outputs. Oh no, that's not what I wanted. Don't share. Uh, where were we? All right. Um, so evaluating um, these models, it's it's like really impressive that these can run in your doll uh, in real time. Um, that's just really cool. Um, and the reason is because these types of models, again, are trying to condense this very uh, large audio input into a really small feature vector. So they end up being pretty efficient. Um, it's really fun to experiment with these uncommon inputs. Um, and when the model makes mistakes, um, it ends up producing interesting results that can inspire you from a sound design perspective. 
Um, the DDSP VST has a really nice visual for tuning like the pitch and loudness range, um, which we saw. Um, although the pitch is calculated using like its own separate neural network. And as we also saw, there can be some artifacts due to the estimation errors, especially when you try to send um, polyphonic in input into it because it's only meant for monophonic audio. Um, and the latent space makes these models adjustable, which is really cool, but they're not interpretable. As we saw in the rave demo, it's hard to steer these models into a specific direction. It really just feels like tuning random dials, which can be fun, but it's a little bit hard to work with um, to get exactly what you want out of them. Uh, another thing to mention about autoencoders is their models are always deterministic, so the same input is always going to produce the same output unless you're like me messing with the feature vector. Uh, so unlike RNNs where you can just keep hitting like regenerate, regenerate, um, that doesn't really work with autoencoders. Um, so a couple of next steps, if this is something that you find interesting, uh, is you can actually get into training your own models instead of using these pre-trained ones. Um, so Google Colab is a really cool platform that allows you to run machine learning models in your browser um, using free compute servers from Google. So they actually give you access to some of their GPUs, um, which is um, what you'll need unless you have like a gaming PC already. Um, and these are all Python code under the hood, but a lot of them have a code-free interface. So even if you're not a programmer yourself, um, there's usually a way you can interact with them um, through a GUI. Um, and you can actually train your own DDSP model um, using Google Colab. Um, I'll just show you quickly what one of those notebooks looks like. Yeah, so um, this is Google Colab. It's all Python code under the hood, but you can see this is a pretty uh, code-free set of instructions. Um, you'll just create a folder in your Google Drive, um, put some audio into it. Um, and then you can set some training parameters. And under the hood, all this code looks like this, but you can just totally ignore that um, and just press the buttons. And then once you've trained your own model, um, you can actually load it into the DDSP VST um, and play around with it. So you could do something like record yourself playing guitar for 30 minutes, train a model on it, and load it into the VST plugin and play around with it, which is super cool. Um, and it, these DDSP models usually take like two to three hours um, to train, and you can even experiment with some different training parameters if you're feeling adventurous. Uh, and like I said, then you can load them into the DDSP uh, VST and play around with them in your DAW. If you want to go even one step further, then you could start thinking about um, designing your own models um, if you're familiar with coding. Um, so a couple other models that I didn't have time to mention, um, generative adversarial networks, GANs are also pretty popular in the music generation space, and also transformer models are super popular lately uh, for symbolic music generation. Um, I don't know of any specific VST plugins um, for these types of models. They, they might exist, I just haven't uh, come across them. Um, and a lot of researchers are releasing their code and their pre-trained models online through Google Colab or GitHub. Um, it's pretty much all written in Python using one of the libraries for machine learning, PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, and there are a lot of free resources online um, if you want to learn how to code in Python or learn one of these libraries. Um, and again, through Google Colab, you can get some free compute resources because a lot of these models you will require a GPU to train on. Um, you can also pay to get some additional compute resources um, to train up the models faster. Um, and a couple other plugins to check out that I didn't have time to cover. Um, Magenta Studio, I showed the continue application, but they have a couple other cool plugins for like connecting melodies together or like making drum beats sound more realistic. Um, Sony also has a couple of music generation plugins, uh, and Malfi actually did end up covering. Um, that's something that recently came out uh, from ByteDance. Um, and then just contact info uh, for this presentation. So I've been Sarah. Um, feel free to email me with any questions or if you have cool stuff you want to tell me about. I'm always happy to talk about any use case of machine learning and music. 
Um, you can check out some more of my work on my website, sarahadkins.com, and some of my code is on GitHub. Um, I have a Twitter, and if you want to reference this slide deck directly, um, you can check out this bit.ly link, and there's also a QR, QR code for it here. Um, and yeah, that's it. So I guess question time now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I've just thrown out onto the stream that um, people can start submitting their questions. So we'll start off taking uh, questions from the room. I'm going to rove this mic around. The reason we have this mic is so the stream can hear it, by the way, in case you were thinking, why we can't hear, like, what? <laughs> okay, um, it's so the folks over there can hear what we're doing. Uh, ditto for Sarah's mic there. So uh, does anyone have any questions they've been sitting on during this presentation? I know one of you's got one somewhere. Because that was too much interesting information to not have <laughs> any questions. Um, actually, I was going to, I have a couple, just to get things rolling. Um, What's the best instance that you've experienced where some of the techniques that you've described today have helped you to overcome writer's block? Yeah, um, so let's see. Uh, I think the, the timbre transfer technique that I covered um, is really the main thing because I do a lot of like ambient compositions. So a lot of the times if I'm just not sure where to start, I'll just end up like picking one of the models and sending um, different different synthesizers through it and seeing if I come up with something cool. And if I do, I'll kind of use that as the basis of the whole um, composition, because I really like working with like different musical textures and those timbre transfer models are really good at that. Mm, OK, interesting. Um, anybody else? Yes. Um, are there any like ethical or copyright issues with using models trained on pieces that other people have written? Like, at what point is it your work versus someone else's that the model's regenerating? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a really uh, important topic in the community. Um, if you've heard of, like, uh, the jukebox model that OpenAI has trained up, I mean, they basically um, scraped, like, all of these songs um, from the internet to generate raw audio. Um, and there is the ethical question of, like, well, if you're basing your stuff off of other people's work, do they deserve any credit for it because you use their work? Um, in training your model. Um, and some people will say like, oh, well, no, because um, artists are inspired from other artists all the time, so why can't an AI um, be inspired by other people's work? Um, but it definitely is especially an issue if a model is trained in such a way that its output um, is like directly copying um, the music of another person. Um, or for instance, if you're trying to like train a model on a specific artist to like emulate their style, that can be an ethical issue um, as well. Like we do it a lot for, for Bach, like we train models on Bach chorales, but that doesn't matter because he died like hundreds of years ago, so <laughs> he doesn't care. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like a big, a big issue in the field. Anyone else? Thoughts, questions, ideas, comments? Yeah. I should really just stay in Thanks. Um, so DALI 2 has become a very uh, popular thing recently. Um, do you envisage that there's a possibility that there might be a musical equivalent of DALI 2, or is there already one I don't know about? Uh, I, w I don't know if there's a specific music equivalent of it, because basically what it does is you type in text and it, it generates um, an image based on that text for people who don't know. Um, it would be really cool to see that applied to music if you could just say, write me like a piece in the style of, of Vivaldi for four measures. Um, but I think that the music domain is like a little bit behind the visual domain and those types of things, because all the time dependencies in music make it such a challenging problem that we're not really able to generate full songs yet. Um, so I'd love to see it, but I don't think it's a thing yet. Maybe soon. Maybe soon. Maybe soon, if everyone in this room gets inspired and wants to start <laughs> putting stuff together. OK, anybody else? OK, uh, so um, are there any key artists that you know of who are using these kinds of techniques to make music? 
Um, I think one of the artists that really inspired a lot of my work uh, is Holly Herndon. She came out with an album called Proto a couple years ago where she used um, sample RNN to generate um, some of the songs. And there's a really cool one where I think she fed audio of someone like beatboxing into a drum um, algorithm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good album um, and I love her work. Awesome. We have a couple of questions from the stream. Um, uh, so, Ayas Sandscapes uh, has asked, did you learn Python? If so, how much to which level do you think you need to know? Yeah, it, I think it depends um, how, how much, how deep you want to get into it. Like, if you want to design your own model that's never been done before, you, you need a pretty deep understanding of like a lot of existing machine learning models and Python. But if you just want to do something like tweak someone else's code, like I said, a lot of researchers release their code online. Um, so if you know like the basics of Python, you can kind of like trial and error, usually figure out what is going on um, and make the edits yourself. Um, I learned Python um, just while I was in college because I studied computer science, but there are just so many resources online for learning it for free as well. Awesome. Thank you, Ayas, for your question. Uh, and next is from Adam, who, is, uh, who said, thanks for the excellent talk and demonstration, Sarah. I especially appreciate the introduction to um, Arkham's Rave Inside Max MSP. Have you tried training it or just have been using the Arkham trainings? No, I haven't tried training it myself yet. Um, I don't think that they have a non-code interface for training, but they do have it released as Python scripts. So I think you can train it yourself with, with pretty minimal Python knowledge, but I haven't tried it myself yet. Is it on your agenda? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, any other questions? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, how have you used machine learning in some of your own compositions and things like that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just pick one to talk about. Um, so when I was in my undergrad, um, I did a set of algorithmic compositions for my capstone project. Um, and one that I really liked was called Recurrent Neural Networks on Bach. Um, so basically what I did is I trained a, a recurrent neural network on Bach corrals, but I kind of saved different versions of it as it was training. Um, so I set up the performance so you could kind of cycle through the different models so it would play phrases that basically sounded like just random gibberish early in training and you could kind of move through the different models and so it kind of starts from like atonal nonsense and eventually gets to a box style composition over the course of like 15 minutes. Where can we listen? To Where can we hear? Oh, it? oh yeah, it's um, a, a lot of my stuff's on my website. So that that recording in particular, I have a performance uh, from when I performed it at Carnegie Mellon back when I was an undergrad. Okay, awesome. Um, could you remind us of the different kind of softwares and programs that you've explored today? Because I I was trying to like recall them back, and I was like, there's a lot here. Yeah, so. yeah, we can do a brief um, overview. Um, but again, if you this this slide deck should be publicly available if you ever want to revisit it. Awesome. Because um, we started with uh, recurrent neural networks and focused on melody generation. And the examples I gave um, were folk RNN, which is an in-browser model. Um, and then Magenta Studio Continue, which is standalone application or Ableton Live. Mm. Um, and then when we got into timbre transfer, um, we covered two VST plugins. One was DDSP and one was Mouth. Uh, and then for Rave, that is the Maximus P external that is also available as a VST. It just crashes my laptop when I try to run it. <laughs> uh, but my laptop's seven years old, so maybe yours will have better luck with it. I mean, it's doing well. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, it, the fact that it can run any of these makes me pretty <laughs> proud of it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm always thrilled when all my plugins run. As they yeah, should. exactly. It's like, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, any last questions? Okay, cool. I'm just going to check the stream. I think there was a question, but someone else on the stream answered it for the person. Okay, we'll, oh, probably, cool. uh, we'll probably leave it there then. Um, in which case, thank you so much. Sarah, yeah, thank for you for evening. having me. It's been incredibly interesting. I don't know about anybody else, but I've just got a ton of ideas. So that's 
always very nice thing to end a session on. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, so basically we um, have another session coming up. Actually, we have a lot of sessions coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, they're mostly on Tuesdays. You can check them all out at musichackspace.org. Um, we have them all listed. Um, all of the WeMoo sessions are free because the Arts Council gave us some money. Thanks, Arts Council. And so did Focus Right. So thank you to both Arts Council and Focus Right for their sponsorship of this series. Um, and a special thank you, of course, to the UAL uh, Creative Computing Institute for hosting us and facilitating this stream with their wonderful team, who we always love working with. So um, thanks to them. If you are keen to, um, to basically check out any of the coming uh, sessions we have, um, Coming up, we have Shigal, who is uh, a Mimu expert, um, who will be delivering a session, a very, very special, very exclusive session uh, behind the scenes of her new tour, which is called Unlocked. And she'll be exploring um, the, with us the incredible um, both visual and audio technology has developed, she has developed in a system called BABY. Um, and uh, so if you want to come along and find out about that, that's coming up in the next few weeks. We also have Anna Disclaim, who's doing a, an Ableton special um, for us, exploring the functions that are unique to Ableton as a door. So if you have never used Ableton before, or if you've been using Ableton for ages, you will all find something new in that kind of a session. Crikey, who else have we got coming up? We've got, um, we've got Eve Horn, who's also coming to talk about transitioning between um, uh, logic and Ableton and using doors as tools. Um, we have, a, oh, we just have loads. We have loads. It's all up on the website. Go to musichackspace.org um, and you can find out about all of them as well as all our of other lovely courses which cover all kinds of not just music technology, but visual technology too. We explore sessions with Touch Designer, with Max, with a ton of other softwares and technologies. So do explore what we have available. And after all that spiel, I hope that uh, you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for the folks that came in IRL today and for everyone who showed up on the stream. You were all awesome. Um, and I think that will do. So everyone have a great evening. We'll see you at the next one.